Hello and welcome to the surprisingly simple rectangle. This is meant to be the first in a series of three classes to help people get started who are either new to medieval sewing or new to sewing entirely with some basic early to high medieval clothing that they can make and wear to participate in the Society for Creative Anachronism, where I am known as Lady Katarina da Savona, or at Ren Fairs, or LARP, or any other pursuit that brings you joy. Starting at the top, when I say rectangular, what am I talking about? Rectangular construction is more of a logic. It's a style or an approach to garment construction that was used historically for a very long time to use simple geometric shapes cut out of fabric panels in order to fit around a three-dimensional body that isn't really rectangular at all. The tunic that we're going to be making is a very simple one. It has two large rectangles that serve as the body, one in the front and one in the back. It has two smaller rectangles that have been tapered, almost like a cone cross-section that will serve as our sleeves. Underneath the arm, there are also a couple of squares called gussets that help to provide ease of motion and to protect this part of the garment from tearing out when we move and do other activities. The last part of the body are these great big triangles inserted into the lower hem that give us the range of motion that we need in order to live and walk and play and fight and build camp and do all of the other things that we want to do that people did historically. Finally, for this pattern, I'm going to show you how to do the contrasting neck facing. We are though going to have to cover a few terms of art. Today, I wanna to start with talking about gores, godets, and gussets. They're all different words for how to add fabric in an area of either high stress or where more fullness is desired. Technically, what we're making in this pattern is called a godet. It's a triangular piece that is only inserted into one of the hems and it goes part way up the body. Colloquially, almost everyone calls them gores. Even though technically a gore goes all the way from the top to the bottom of the piece, realistically it does the same job and I'm not going to get very pedantic about the difference. Some people care, so I want to make sure that I'm clear up front with the difference in case this matters to you. And then finally we have gussets, which are pretty easy to tell apart from the others because they're simply inserted internally. So looking at this garment that we're going to make, the bonus is that it's loose and comfortable. It adapts really well to a wide range of body types and yet the style of construction is suitable for much of the medieval era. This approach to garment construction was used at least since the late Roman Empire, possibly earlier, but there's not a lot of data the further back we go in time, until at least the mid 1300s when tailoring underwent a rapid shift in how garments were constructed. It's great because, again, it supports a full range of motion. It lets us do all the things that we want to do. At the same time, it does need a belt for shape because it's essentially a tubular body. And if you have a waist and you want to look like you have a waist, you do need a belt. Something that might look a little odd to you is the dropped shoulder seam. When you cut the body panels to be as large as the body is around, you end up with a shoulder that drops off over into the arm a little bit, and this is called a dropped shoulder. We do have extra bulk in the upper arm of the sleeve that allows us the movement that we need later, because these are non-stretch fabrics. When you take your arm, you bring it forward and you bend it around, it's going to suck up a lot of that extra fabric that we're building into the pattern. You need that fabric so that you don't put too much stress on your seams and cause them to pull out over time. It's the same reason we have the underarm gusset. It's to protect seams from an area that would otherwise be very high stress. Even though that bulk in the armpit looks a little bit weird to us because we no longer make garments in this way. But I want to be honest and straightforward. This is a historical style based on the very fragmentary evidence we have. We're asking garments to survive a thousand years or more in the dirt 
or in other less than ideal conditions. This is a common pattern used by both medieval reenactors and people in the SCA, so it's very well recognized and well understood. The way we are doing it is the quick and dirty, just cover my nakedness, I want to have my first garment so I can go to events. We're not going to do reenactor level process or materials, and we're not going to add a lot of extra seams in order to get a more shaped body. There are great classes that do this online, and I don't see any need to reinvent the wheel. As I mentioned, this is going to be the first of three sessions. In this session, we're going to make a pattern and then have homework to get ready to sew. In the second session, we'll have a sew along where we make the garment with some guidance from more experienced sewists. And then in the third session, there will be space to discuss the different ways that this style has been adapted throughout history in specific cultures and specific times, as well as a number of really easy variations on this pattern that will let you get a lot of different looks. And here we are again with a few terms of art. I'm going to have you cut pieces of fabric that are a little bit larger than the body measurements you take. And I don't want you to think those are arbitrary. You're adding extra for reasons. When you make a garment, we're going to add extra for the seam allowance. When you sew a seam together, that's the part that flops around inside the garment. It helps to stabilize that seam and it gives the thread something to pull against so it doesn't just go sliding out the end of your fabric panel. We're going to add a hem allowance because lower edges of sleeves and skirts all need to have a hem to, again, stabilize raw edges. And it's going to have ease, which we already mentioned, is the built-in looseness that you have to use in a non-stretch fabric to get full range of activity and motion out of your garments. The first body measurement we're going to do is width. If you're planning to wear this garment under something really bulky, like over your armor or over several other layers because you're making a jacket or some sort of other outerwear, put all of that on and then simply measure over it. If you're just going to wear normal undergarments underneath this, then you can wear your street clothes, jeans and a t-shirt, for example, and measure over those. To do this first width measurement, I'm going to have you take the tape measure around your body just below your armpits and then walk it all the way down your body looking for the largest circumference that you can find. It's going to be different for everyone because we're all round in different places, but whatever the single largest dimension is, write that down. Divide by two front and back panels and then add three inches for ease. The length is easier because really it's more of a aesthetic or cosmetic decision. But whatever length you pick, you're going to add six inches that will get used up in various ways for hem and so on and so forth. Length is fun. Medievally, length was used in a lot of ways to express job descriptions, to express wealth, to express style, and even to reflect gender expression. Even though this pattern is exactly the same for all of those different people, they would wear it in different lengths. Working lengths, active lengths, active wear tended to be shorter than garments that you're going to wear to just stand around in court. In general, masculine presenting people wore their garments a little bit shorter than feminine presenting people of the same social status. But people of higher rank wore garments with more length. Fabric was expensive and using more of it was a sign of wealth. Now it's time to do the sleeves. Sleeve length, as I mentioned, needs to be a little bit over long, but this pattern with the drop shoulder will take care of all of that for you, so you don't need to worry about it unless you make a different kind of pattern later. I'm going to have you measure from the point of your shoulder. That's the little nubby of bone right at the top of your arm where the shoulder and the arm come together to the first knuckle of your wrist. And that is going to be the length of the sleeve that you cut for a full length sleeve. The width will use three measurements and I'm going to give you three different options for sleeves. A roll up sleeve, a fitted tapered sleeve, and a short sleeve. We're starting at the body 
measure around your upper arm as close to the shoulder as you can get and add three inches for ease and seam allowance. At the elbow, you're going to measure and again add three inches. It does not matter if your elbow is flexed or extended because there's enough ease in this pattern to make the difference irrelevant. And then you're going to measure your hand because you have to stuff your hand through this. You're going to take your hand, you're going to measure around it, and then you're going to add three inches to make a loose sleeve that you can roll up. Once you have your measurements, you're going to connect them in any way that looks good to you. My one recommendation, make sure that the end near the wrist has at least a few straight parallel inches because it will be much, much easier to hem and to add trim later if this is straight. The tapered sleeve, exact same measurements, exact same approach, but at the wrist end of the sleeve, add only one and a half inches to your hand measurement. And again, make sure that you've got a nice straight zone at the end. Finally, for a short sleeve, you just whack it off. Short sleeves are in fact terribly forgiving. You don't even have to cut it as a trapezoid if you don't feel like it. You can simply cut a rectangle and make a tube. However, do make it longer than you think you will need it. When you actually put this on your body, there are some things that can happen with the bulk of the upper arm muscles and around the shoulder and the way your arm falls that will make the outer edge right up and the inner edge sort of sag down. You may, when you do your final fitting, want to take some scissors and cut this off parallel to the ground and straighten it up a bit. Leave yourself some extra length so that you have the option later if you end up wanting it. Now we're going to add the parts that help us move, and it's time to do a couple more terms of art. Grain and bias. The grain is your warp and your weft. In these woven fabrics, it's especially important. When you buy a modern fabric, it comes off the bolt with a selvage on the long edge. That's your long grain, and it's the direction with the least amount of stretch. At 90 degrees of that is your cross grain. That's going to maybe have a little bit of stretch, but when you take it on the diagonal at a 30 or 45 degree angle and tug on it, this is the bias and bias stretch was something used medievally in very clever ways to help garments move the way they needed them to and to make up for the fact that they did not have knit stretchy fabrics like we do. So our lower hem, again, these big triangles known as godets, are going to give us the ability to move our legs as much as we want or need to move them. So figuring out how wide to cut those triangles depends on how you want to use your garment. If all you want to do is walk, stick a measuring tape or a yardstick or anything else on the floor, take a great big step, measure from one heel to the other toe, double it up, and that will give you a close enough circumference for the hem for anything around floor or ankle length and a generous circumference for anything shorter. But if you really want to be active because you're going to be fighting or hiking or doing any other sort of really good activity in this, I would like you to get a friend. Have your friend help you measure the actual distance between your legs when you make your widest fighting stance or the biggest step you're ever going to take when you climb up on a log on the hiking trail, have your friend measure the actual distance around your legs at the level of your future garment. For a lot of these, that's going to be around knee length. Once you have the circumference, cut it, divide it in two, and then subtract the width of the body rectangle you already calculated and give me at least two inches for your seam allowances. This is your minimum width for each big triangle. If you want to use more, absolutely you can use more. If you want to use lots and lots because you are showing off the amount of fabric that you have and you have this fabulously wealthy idea for the persona you want to represent, go for it. The length of these triangles is also pretty flexible. I generally take them to the point of the hip, that's where the bone sticks out on the side of your hip, because that's where our legs really start to deviate from each other when we walk. But some people like to take them to the waist and that's fine. Either one 
just pick what you would like and measure from the length of your future garment to that point on your body. You might be wondering, how on earth am I supposed to get these monster triangles out of rectangular fabric? And this is your answer. Here are two common, easy ways to pull it off. On the left, if you make a slightly oversized rectangle, slash it diagonally to get two big triangles. And then just fold each of those triangles and use scissors to square them up so that the two legs are the same length. You can get two large, generous godets out of a rectangle. On the right, we've cut one rectangle into a big triangle and two half triangles, which will need to be seamed together in the center. It will make this godet a little narrower than the other one, but the difference is trivial. Most people will never notice, and we have historical evidence for them doing the exact same thing. So feel free to piece these as much as you want or need in order to get the look that you want. And then the last part of the body we're going to cut are simple. It's just those little squares for the underarm. There are a lot of different ways to come around to the size that you want to use, but my rule of thumb is a five inch square for a five foot tall person, a six inch square for a six foot tall person, and then add one inch for anyone who's going to be a terribly active. Make sure that you cut this so that the two straight edges are straight to the grain and the bias is moving diagonally across the square because that is the future direction of force on this garment. And then we're going to do a neckline, as I mentioned, in contrasting fabric. I only need two measurements for this one. The first one is the circumference of your neck at the base of your neck, not in the middle, divided by pi 3.14 to get the diameter of a circle that will fit around your neck. Scribe that circle out on a piece of paper, and that will be your cut line. Now you're going to draw a seam line that is either one quarter inch larger all the way around. That's for a very fitted neck like I'm wearing in my pictures. Or one half inch larger all the way around, which is for a slightly looser neck that doesn't touch quite as much, and some people prefer that. Whatever seam line you pick, mark it on your pattern. Now measure the circumference of your head around your head at the biggest point and subtract the circumference of your neck. That difference tells us how much we need to add in order to pull this over our head. Divide the difference by two because there's two sides to the slit. That is the length of your neck slit. Three and a half to five inches for most adults. Yes, you can cut it longer if it fits your aesthetic, if you want it for your style, if you just want it to fit over your head more easily, absolutely make it longer but I do draw this with an extremely narrow seam allowance, so make sure you draw that in too. Now's the fun part. You can take that core, which looks like a lollipop on a stick, and draw literally any shape you want around it, because that's going to become your neck facing. You can simply follow the lollipop with a two or three inch wide border, or you can add a large triangular or Y-shaped yoke, or even a great big square full-on yoke-shaped yoke. Now double check, you should have a plan to make body pieces, two sleeves, two lower godets, pieces are fine, two underarm gussets, and one neck facing. And then, before we start cutting and laying out, one final double check. Look at that plan. Will the body width actually fit over all the parts of your torso? Will those gores and godets, when you add them to the body width, make a lower hem that is in fact generous enough for the way you want to use this garment? And make sure that you can actually stick your head through the gap created by the neckline and the slit. That's it. That's all there is to patterning this very simple garment. For people that are doing this as an in-person class, or if you're going to follow along at home, we're going to have some homework between this session and the next one where you get ready to sew. The first thing you'll probably want to do is make a cutting diagram. Figure out how to get all these pieces out of the fabric. Modern fabric comes in a lot of different widths, so you might want to have an idea which fabric you're interested in, 
make a cutting diagram for that width, and then go and buy the fabric in the appropriate amount. Do add a quarter to a half a yard for shrinkage and a little bit of allowance for tiny mistakes. Here you can see my cutting diagram for a piece of fabric I got at the thrift store. Now you're ready to actually select fabric. For this first time, especially if you're a little bit new to sewing, I do recommend nothing really stretchy or slippery. If it slides through your fingers like grease, it's going to slide off the top of your sewing machine like it was greased and it's really frustrating. I will recommend solid colors without a lot of directionality. If you have a pattern, use a small one. I prefer to start out with inexpensive fabrics that still look good enough to wear. I want you to have something you can immediately take out and wear and use, but I do know from experience the first time you make a pattern, you're going to do okay. The second time you make the same pattern, you're going to do quite a bit better. And the third time you make this pattern, it is going to be great. Finally, if you really just want to take this so that you can rip it apart and make a pattern for the future that you'll have forever, uh, old sheets work great. I have quite a few patterns made out of old sheets. But do be mindful of the fabric content. There are a lot of fabrics out there, and they vary a lot in their characteristics, how historical they were, and how easy they are to get modernly. On the really breathable side, we start with linen. It was common throughout the medieval period. It is incredibly breathable. You can freeze to death in a rainstorm if you're wearing linen because it is so good at wicking and drying moisture. It's great in the summer. It loves to wrinkle, it loves to unravel, and it's a little spendy in the modern world. So a lot of people might work in cotton, even though it wasn't available in most medieval cultures. It's really inexpensive and easy to get today. It does like to wrinkle, not as much. It's less prone to unraveling, and it doesn't breathe quite as well. I have seen bamboo sheets recommended as a modern alternative to linen, especially for people that might have a linen sensitivity, even if it's a little bit less durable than linen. And then we have wool, which was found medievally as well as modernly. It comes in a million different weaves. It can be as fine and airy as gauze, and it can be as thick and impermeable as a coat, and every imaginable weave in between. I will caution you a little bit about using fabrics that include rayon, also known as viscose or modal. It's made out of short cellulose fibers and they have poor durability against rubbing, especially when they're wet, which means in short, they hate your washing machine. You may want to save rayon for parts of your kit that don't get washed quite as frequently as the rest. On the other side, fabrics that don't breathe as well, but will keep you warm, we have, again, wool. Felted, fold, boiled, and melted are all words for wool that has somehow been treated in a way to close up the air gaps and make it less breathable. Silk, we know, has been around for hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of years. It was found medievally. It was imported as a trade good to many cultures, even those that didn't make their own silk. If you want to do a deep dive, there are actually different colors and different patterns of weave that were available in different times over the centuries. Silk has a lot of things going for it, but it is pretty unforgiving of sewing mistakes, so I may not recommend it for your first garment while you're learning how to do things. And I must caution you that sometimes when an internet sale looks too good to be true, it is. A lot of things that are sold as silk are silk-like polyester and other blends. Polyester is terribly modern, but it is reasonably inexpensive, reasonably durable, and it's very good at mimicking other fabrics such as silk. It has a price point that's much more accessible to a lot of people. Whatever fabric you pick, you need to prepare it. Woven fabrics, especially out of natural fibers, are going to shrink the first time they're hit with hot air and hot water. So I want you to get that out of the way before you sew it. I like to use the bathtub. It 
gets around any problems with the agitator trying to grab your fabric and pull on it or rip it or stretch it out of shape. And you don't have to worry about the edges unraveling because they're being treated too roughly. I pre-wash my fabrics in the bathtub using water hotter than I'm ever going to wash the final garment in. Drain it, rinse it. If it bleeds, continue to wash it and rinse it and wash it and rinse it until you get all the color out. Or else you might find down the road, for example, that you have a lovely dark red contrasting trim that is bleeding into your beige garment a little bit more every time you wash it. Oops. Anyways, after you have your fabric washed, pop it in the dryer on a hotter temperature setting than you're ever going to want to actually dry it on, fold it up, and you are ready to sew. So now you have fabric, you have a pattern. The last thing I need you to do is become familiar with your sewing machine. At a minimum, I would like you to learn how to thread your machine correctly. How to sew a straight line, a straight stitch with a back stitch on each end. Some people call these lock stitches. How to sew any kind of zigzag or overlock stitch, again, with back stitching on each end. And then look at the little plate under your foot and learn where your machine's guides are for the one quarter and one half inch seams so that you're familiar with it later. Most common sewing machine models will have a YouTube video that someone has made on getting started with your exact machine. For people that are coming to this class in person for the sew along, we will have experienced sewists to help you as much as possible. But please help us help you. We may not know your exact machine as well as someone on YouTube who actually uses it all the time. That is it for this session. For the next session, I would like you to uh, please bring your sewing machine if you can. Learn how to sew on your own machine with experienced oversight and then you can come home and be ready to make more stuff on your own. Please bring some scissors, thread, pins, measuring tapes, if you have them. We will have some with us, but you can never have too many. And we're going to approach the assembly in a way that I have found in the past works really well for beginners to help head off some of the most common mistakes like I sewed the seam inside out, I sewed the sleeve on backwards, and so on and so forth. And huzzah, we are done. I would like to especially thank my co-conspirators and my beta readers who've helped me go through this content and make sure it is suitably appropriate to beginning sewists. And I would like to thank you for sitting through my first YouTube video all the way to the end. I wish you a wonderful day and I hope that you do well.